SOAS China Institute. Um, this is our second seminar webinar this term. And may I remind you that this meeting is being recorded and it will be made available on our website after, afterwards. When you would like to raise a question, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. When you do so, and if you would like to stay anonymous, please say so, and your uh, wish will be respected. Nonetheless, it would be helpful to me as the moderator to know who you are. So if you could say, uh, provide some information as to who you are, it will simply make it easier for me to moderate and um, pick the questions, but I will respect those who would prefer to stay anonymous. The subject of today's webinar is the making of China's wolf warrior diplomacy. And the speaker we have is Peter Martin, who has just written a book on this very subject. Uh, Peter is a career journalist with Bloomberg. He had previously been based in Beijing, where he covered extensively on the escalating tension between China and the United States. And he had also reported from China's border with North Korea and in terms of um, China's Xinjiang area. He is now based back in uh, the United States in or around Washington DC, where he is Bloomberg's defense policy and intelligence report. And the subject itself is of course a very important one as we have seen in the last two years, a significant change in the way how China manages its diplomacy. With that, over to you, Peter, for your introduction. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, for hosting me. It's a real pleasure to um, to be talking to SOAS. Um, I, when I was studying in London, made a made a habit of spending as much time as I could in the SOAS library, um, which is just a, a wonderful facility. And uh, so I'm a great admirer of the institution. Um, but you know, I, so I thought I, I would talk a little bit about how I how I came to write the book, um, and then you know outline some of my my key arguments. Um, and I, I guess the the starting point for this was really my arriving back in China in early 2017. Uh, I'd been away for a few years, um, living in India and then in in, in Washington, and. Uh, you know, was it was immediately struck when I arrived back in Beijing by the extraordinary economic and military progress that that China had made. Um, it was rolling out, uh, you know, Xi Jinping was rolling out the Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiative. Um, China's economy was beating estimates. Um, China was on the cusp of uh, opening its first overseas military base in in Djibouti. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the, the Chinese military was also busy building artificial islands in the in the South China Sea. Um, and but but perhaps more important than any of that, there was this extraordinary opportunity there um, created by the Trump administration in large part. Um, Trump was busy picking fights with US allies um, all over the world and taking issue with multinational institutions, uh, multilateral institutions. And, and there seemed to be this kind of leadership vacuum developing, which um, you know, was ripe for, for China's taking, I think. And you know, we saw in um, Xi Jinping's speech to the Davos Forum in January 2017, a real concerted effort to kind of step up and take that mantle. Um, but, but the longer I, I, was, I was based in Beijing and the, the more I kind of watched this unfold, the, the clearer it became 
that it, it had really been incredibly difficult for China to step up and, and take on that leadership role. And that as effective as the Chinese government was at using economic inducements to win over others or you know, threats of coercion in other cases to dissuade people from acting in ways it didn't like, the ability to actively persuade um, other countries and you know, uh, publics in, in other nations of China's point of view was, uh, was a real shortcoming of the system. And it made it hard for China to step up into that vacuum. And, and, and I, you know, I started to think about why that was and, and why it might matter. And I think, I think the reason it matters is that we're moving away from a world which is centered uh, and, and built around any one power in the international system. We've got, we're going to have multiple centers of global power, including Beijing, and the ability of any one country to kind of have its way is going to be limited. And there'll be an advantage for nations which are able to, to make their case and have that power to persuade. And so, so for me, Chinese diplomats kind of became a, a microcosm of, of China's broader struggle to communicate with the outside world. Um, and, you know, I, I saw this on a personal level as well. Um, when you meet with Chinese diplomats in person um, or you talk to, um, you know, foreign, foreign diplomats who, who do so frequently as well, you realize that, that China, you know, Chinese diplomats are highly educated. They're fluent often in multiple foreign languages. They've become deeply expert in the societies to which they've been posted over the years, um, as well as, you know, issues ranging from financial regulation to, to climate change and, and, and non-proliferation and beyond. Um, and, and, you know, they, they, can be, they can be suave and funny and uh, very effective on a personal level. But when they get up on the podium in the foreign ministry to give press conferences, or they sit across the table from their foreign counterparts, you, you see that effectiveness kind of diminish and the behavior becomes much more stilted, sometimes ideological. Um, and, you know, in, in recent years, of course, also increasingly hostile um, when they're sitting across from others. And I started to get curious about, you know, what were the roots of this behavior and why was there this huge um, gap between capability and delivery, um, and 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 as I did so, I I I you know I was doing interviews, of course, with with people in Beijing um, and and here in Washington and elsewhere. But I I also became drawn to this, this collection of memoirs by former Chinese diplomats, um, starting out with. Uh, you know, there were a, a couple of memoirs written by former foreign ministers and, and really very senior figures, but I soon discovered using Baidu and secondhand bookshops and government bookshops and those, those kinds of things that there were more than 100 of these memoirs written by figures ranging from former foreign ministers to ambassadors to cultural attaches and military attaches and junior diplomats and, and a, a whole range of backgrounds. And I really used that as my main source base for this book, um, which, which started off, you know, I think is a, is a relatively niche topic, um, but as Wolf Warrior Diplomacy, as it's become known, kind of became this global phenomenon and, um, you know, Chinese diplomats were seen storming out of international meetings, uh, you know, insulting foreign counterparts, telling foreign politicians to shut up on Twitter, and perhaps most provocatively of all, spreading conspiracy theories about the origins of COVID-19. Um, the, the, the topic of the book became much more, um, much more mainstream. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I was pleased and I was lucky that, um, that I'd been looking into it for for some time, and you know, the 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 thing I think that um, stood out for me as a result of looking at all of these memoirs and conducting the interviews that, that I had done is that Wolf Warrior diplomacy um, seems very new on the surface, but actually its roots go back a long, long way. Um, so when when the PRC was founded by Mao Zedong in 1949. 
uh, China basically had no diplomats to speak of. It, the, the new communist government had kicked out uh, the small number of uh, Kuomintang diplomats who had decided to stay behind, and it, it didn't allow them to take part in China's diplomatic service beyond some very perfunctory sort of advisory roles. The reason for that was that the, the new regime believed that these diplomats were too impure to represent it on the international stage, too ideologically impure. Um, and, and the government kind of faced this paradoxical challenge um, at the, you know, the founding of the PRC. On, on the one hand, this was a, a political regime which was obsessed with secrecy, was highly paranoid, was acutely aware that its, its very existence had been threatened um, from its earliest days. It had been hounded across the country and forced into this kind of underground existence and remained extremely wary of threats from the capitalist United States to the rival regime in Taiwan, which, which claimed to be the legitimate government of China. But at the same time, as it was wary of those threats, it also needed to build bridges with the outside world and to communicate um, and, 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 and win friends and establish itself as the rightful government of China in the eyes of the international system. And, and Zhou Enlai, um, China's first foreign minister, the PRC's first foreign minister, and, uh, and the PRC's first premier, came up with this idea that to kind of square that circle, where he said that, that Chinese diplomats would think and act like, quote, the People's Liberation Army in civilian clothing, when zhuang jie function in Chinese. He said that, that Chinese diplomats would be unfailingly loyal to the Communist Party. They would be disciplined to a fault and they would display what he called a, a fighting spirit whenever China's interests were challenged. And, and what that did was that it, it created for China's first diplomats this, this kind of martial militaristic ethos, which, which came with a bunch of behaviors which were uh, you know, very distinctive and um, were there in 1949, 1950, and, and, and many of which have lasted right through till today. So, you know, among those, you have this, the, the fact that, that PRC diplomats will stick incredibly closely to talking points, even if they're fully aware that those talking points don't resonate with the person sitting across the table from them. Uh, they will move around in pairs using this, this buddy system um, to ensure that they're keeping tabs on each other. The system in Chinese is called Aren Tongxiang, two people moving together. Um, they will sometimes shout at foreign counterparts when they feel uh, like they've been cornered or uh, they worry that they, they won't look tough enough back home. And they will take even the smallest of, of slights or, or, or provocations as sometimes and, and turn them into major international incidents. Um, when they worry that their failure to do so will result in them being judged as, as disloyal back home. And, you know, so this approach to diplomacy led to displays of what we would now call wolf warrior diplomacy right from the outset. So in 1950, this, uh, this veteran revolutionary leader, Wu Xiuquan, um, the guy had, you know, a, a bullet scar across his cheek um, he was a really sort of hardened communist. He led a delegation to the United Nations in New York. And he delivered this speech, which uh, honestly kind of makes today's wolf warriors look like a bunch of wimps. I mean, Wu, Wu stood up and he, he delivered the, um, remarks which Time Magazine described at the time as two awful hours of rasping vituperation, uh, which gives you some idea of the, the tone. Um, and of course, in the in the following decade, in the 1960s, Chinese diplomats were pictured um, engaging in fist fights on the streets of London. They were expelled from some Asian and African nations. And, uh, and actually one, one diplomat was pictured wielding an ax outside the Chinese representative office in London. Um, but, you know, so, so while those wolf warrior type tactics were there from the outset, it's important also to remember that there's an alternative tradition in PRC diplomacy, um, which is based around this idea that China needs to win friends and to build influence around the world. Um, and so, 
So at other times, China's diplomatic corps was capable of taking that great discipline, which Zhou Enlai had stressed the need for, and turning it toward charm offensives, which would win over the world. We saw that um, happen with great effect in the mid-1950s um, at the Bandong Conference. Of, of course, Professor Tang has written an excellent article about the, uh, the, the, the bomb plot that nearly killed Zhou Enlai um, on the way to that, that conference. But, you know, Joe kind of set aside his notes um, and delivered this impromptu speech, which didn't stress uh, the status of Taiwan, uh, didn't stress communist ideology, and really was able to, to help build trust and, 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 and win friends by doing that. Then in the 1990s, uh, Chinese diplomats were highly effective um, and, and, and launched this kind of fight back across the world to improve China's reputation in the aftermath of the, the Tiananmen massacre and launched this multi-decade charm offensive, which culminated in Beijing hosting the 2008 Summer Olympics. Um, so I, I kind of think of these two tendencies in PRC diplomacy. There's a tendency to charm the world um, and there's a tendency to use wolf warrior tactics to tell the world off. Um, and I think that, you know, since, since 2008, and especially in the last few years, we've seen quite a decisive lurch back toward that kind of combative, assertive approach. Um, and, and I think that's been driven by, by two things. Um, on the one hand, there's a new confidence um, on the part of the PRC. And, uh, you know, on the other hand, there are enduring insecurities um, which exist alongside it. Um, the new confidence, I think, really started um, in 2008 with, you know, in the, after China had successfully hosted the Olympics, um, its, its leaders spearheaded this dis incredibly decisive response to the global financial crisis, um, which was hailed around the world. You know, it, cre it created kind of longer term problems for the Chinese economy, but it, at the time was hailed around the world as helping to save the global economy. Um, and, 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 and that confidence that, that kind of went hand in hand with that, this idea that China had a system that could deliver when the West was fumbling and incapable of doing so, that that confidence led to um, a couple of years of really quite assertive diplomacy um, from 2008 to sort of 2010 which uh, was, there was a brief recalibration and then the assertiveness continued full throttle after Xi Jinping became Communist Party General Secretary in the winter of 2012, in November, 2012. Um, and, and since she became General Secretary, you know, Chinese politics, um, China's political system has become an increasingly tense and, and in some respects kind of scary place. Um, she launched a sweeping anti-corruption campaign, which saw um, more than 1.5 million officials punished. He abolished presidential term limits. He experimented with the use of re-education camps in China's far western region of Xinjiang. Uh, he focused on ideology at home and his speeches have, have displayed kind of, in some cases, a, a hostility to outside influences in, 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 in PRC politics and society. And when Chinese diplomats see these signals, they, they, they have this rich context and understanding for what they mean, which many of us as outsiders, I think, lack. Um, and you, know, you need to remember that over the decades, Chinese diplomats have experienced multiple rounds of purges inside the foreign ministry where colleagues have informed on each other. Uh, during the Cultural Revolution, uh, junior diplomats uh, locked Chinese ambassadors in cellars, they forced them to clean toilets, and in some cases they beat them until they coughed up blood. Um, and, and indeed, many Chinese diplomats during that period were sent to re-education camps themselves um, in the Chinese countryside. And so I, you know, I think it's fair to say that Chinese diplomats know how high the stakes can be when you get on the wrong side of the Chinese political system. And so I think what happened was that all of this kind of backdrop helped set a new tone for Chinese diplomacy. And when PRC diplomats heard 
President Xi talking about China moving closer to the center of the global stage, China standing tall in the East, the fact that China would never be bullied, would never give up one inch of territory and all of these, you know, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, all of these phrases which we associate with Xi's presidency and his, uh, his expectations for China's role in the world. Uh, Chinese diplomats kind of took them and mimicked them and in some cases, if they were ambitious, they added a little bit of extra zeal for good measure. And I think that that goes a long way to explaining um, the roots of, of, of PRC, uh, the Wolf Warrior Diplomacy. And that tone really went into high gear after the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, you know, on the, on the one hand, China was under attack for its role in allegedly covering up the origins of the virus. Uh, but it also felt like it had a model that had been vindicated by its ability to, to stop the spread of the virus after the initial outbreak. And it looked around, its leaders looked around the world to Europe and North America and the inability of those political systems to handle that challenge. And kind of similarly to in the financial crisis, they felt that their system had stood the test pretty well, and there was no need for them to listen to hectoring or lecturing from, from the outside. And I think, you know, the, the result of that was this kind of series of outbursts um, around the world, where, as I say, Chinese diplomats were engaging in, in Twitter spats with foreign diplomats. They were telling people to shut up. There were, you know, incidents in countries ranging from Fiji to Papua New Guinea to Brazil to Venezuela to France to Canada to England and, and so on. Um, and, you know, all of this, I think, apparently was was cheered on by President Xi, who at one point wrote a handwritten note to the leadership of the foreign ministry calling for more fighting spirit in Chinese diplomacy. Um, and if, if, if one figure has kind of become um, emblematic of that shift, I think it's one of the, the current foreign ministry spokesmen, Zhao Li Jin. So Zhao started off as this relatively obscure figure posted to Islamabad. Um, and he, he managed to get himself um, into a Twitter fight with Susan Rice. Uh, he built up a, a large Twitter following, which was incredibly rare at the time for a Chinese diplomat. And, and after getting into that fight with former national security advisor, Susan Rice, he, he kind of became this rock star inside the, the foreign ministry. He was catapulted to fame and, and quickly found himself appointed um, spokesman for, for the MFA, making him what, not, not just one of the most prominent Chinese diplomats in the world, but one of the most important faces representing the Chinese government to the world. And, um, you know, since, since taking up that position, he has, um, you know, angered, pretty much everyone who's come across his path, but he, you know, especially the Australian government, he, he posted a, 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 a an image of uh, an illustration, I guess you should say, of, of, of Australian uh, troops um, committing human rights abuses. He um, spread a conspiracy theory, which said that the US army had started the coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan, um, angering people all the way up to the the Trump administration. Uh, and, but, you know, Zhao was not alone um, among, among these kind of wolf warrior figures. The recently departed uh, Chinese ambassador to Sweden, Gui Tong Yo, was summoned to Sweden's foreign ministry 40 times in the space of two years because of his provocative behavior. And when he was asked about it in an interview with the media, he said, uh, for our friends, we have fine wine, and for our enemies, we have shotguns. Um, I think it's, it's important to stress that um, not everyone in, in Chinese diplomatic circles likes this new approach. Um, there are, there's considerable disquiet under the surface, both in, in the foreign ministry, but also in the kind of um, intellectual foreign, po foreign policy circles in, in Beijing and beyond. Um, Yuan Nansheng, China's former consul general in San Francisco, has warned publicly about a trend toward what he calls extreme nationalism in Chinese foreign policy and, and his fear that that might alienate the world. And uh, you know, early on this summer, 
actually Xi Jinping himself uh, told the Politburo study session that um, the country needed to cultivate a more lovable image on the global stage, um, which I think was at least a, a kind of tacit recognition that um, some of Chinese um, China's kind of external propaganda work and its diplomacy was creating a backlash um, overseas. And that, that in many cases, Chinese diplomats have been uh, more frightening than, than lovable in recent years. Um, but it, as I say, um, you know, the roots of this behavior go back a very, very long way. And um, that the fighting spirit that we've all come to know has, um, has been there from the very start. And so I guess with that, I'll, I'll pause my remarks and, uh, and I look forward to a, you know, a, a fun uh, Q&A with, with all of you and some back and forth. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for that very interesting uh, overview. And I will kick off with a question, but before I do that, let me just remind everybody that if you would like to raise a question or make a comment, please use the Q&A box. Um, if possible, please provide some information about who you are, but if you would like to stay anonymous, please say so in your question and I will respect that. Peter, you gave a historic view of the origins of wolf warrior diplomacy, and you underlined quite a bit of continuity there. I would like to push you here in terms of that continuity. I'm wondering whether we really are comparing like with like with the early years of PRC diplomacy and the recent specific brand of wolf warrior approach to diplomacy, which is an oxymoron. I mean, wolf warrior diplomacy is inherently self-contradictory. Of the 1950s and the 1960s that you referred to, you underline that China did not really have many diplomats. And it was also a period of time when the Chinese government under Mao was really not that worried about engaging with the rest of the world beyond the socialist fraternity. And therefore you had the kind of antics that you cited of Wu Shouchuan, General Wu Shouchuan at the United Nations, and that kind of behavior, but relatively, in fact, few and far between. I mean, when the Chinese diplomats storm out of the Chinese embassy in London to attack uh, people demonstrating outside, uh, it was in the midst of the Cultural Revolution, when it was a matter of political survival for some of the diplomats to behave the ways that they did. In the same period, and you yourself have cited example of Zhou Enai at Bangdong, and they were not that difficult to find other occasions and examples to show how Chinese diplomacy, when it was necessary, was sophisticated and effective. And Zhou Enai himself had that classic picture of embarrassing was it John Foster Dallas at the um, Geneva, Geneva Conference of, yeah. of 54? When it was Joe and I who extended his hand, which Dallas did not take. And it presented a very negative image of American diplomacy and a rather positive image of Chinese diplomacy. So what I'm putting to you is that that's quite a different kind of situation where they did not have enough well-trained diplomats to be effective to begin with. There was not a priority to project a positive image of China, but if and when they did require that, they were perfectly able to do that. Um, whereas now we have a policy of the Chinese government to promote a good public image of China 
to promote soft power in China at a time when China has enormous capacity uh, to exert soft power, and yet it has produced roof warrior diplomats. Are we comparing like with like here? Uh, tremendous question. And um, there's, there's kind of a lot to dig into. And so I guess, um, you know, the, the, the first thing that I would say is that like, of, of course, these, uh, uh, it's, it's always difficult to draw direct comparisons between, you know, and sort of suggest that, that, that the past is working in the same way as the present. And there's that uh, famous uh, quote attrib often attributed to, to Mark, Twain, Mark Twain, where he says that the history doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. And I think that, that that's the right way to think of um, these kind of historical cycles between um, you know, as I was saying, this, these wolf warrior tactics and then these charm offensive sort of behaviors um, in the past. And, you know, in the book, I kind of do a, a you know, there's this chapter by chapter breakdown where I detail um, many instances, as, as you said, of this kind of charm diplomacy and this sophistication. And then quite a lot of instances of, of, of these kind of more combative tactics too, um, stretching from Wu Zetuan in, in 1950, but also of course, the extended period of the, the Sino-Soviet split, uh, virtually all of China's diplomacy toward the, the West at periods in the 1950s, which quickly changed in you know, charm, charm diplomacy toward the Gauls France and, and those kind of things. So there's this kind of cycling in and out um, over time. But I think, I think the reason that the comparison is instructive is that many of the um, behaviors and the incentives that drove Chinese diplomats to act in those ways in the past still exist in the foreign ministry of today. And, and the reason that those incentives are similar are, are you know, first of all, China's political system in, in some, you know, of, of course, there have been great changes, but in some very fundamental ways, China's political system has, you know, w w works in, in, in sort of comparable ways, 49 through to now with the, the Politburo structure and, and the, this idea that the, the, the writ of the party runs through um, the whole government apparatus. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, actually, if you I've talked to some Chinese diplomats about this, um, you know, the, the fact that when Wang Yi became foreign minister, he used this language again of Chinese diplomats being the People's Liberation Army in civilian clothing. Um, and it's been kind of, it's if you look at the memoirs over the years, it's been this continuous reference point where they'll use this phrase, uh, almost always in Chinese, almost never in English, um, to talk about the, the ethos of the, the foreign ministry. And, one diplomat I, I mentioned it to said that he thought the foreign ministry was almost unique um, in the government because of the degree of continuity that was there from 49 and now. And it's it's a little, I think of it a little bit like um, J. Ed, J. Edgar Hoover's impact on the FBI. It was this institution that was kind of molded in the image of one person in the case of the foreign ministry, Zhou Enlai. Um, and it's 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 kind of way of thinking and its way of doing business was um, was uh, you know pretty consistent over time given the dramatic and um, extraordinary changes that China overwent uh, during that period. So I hope I hope that goes some way to answering your question. Thank you. Um, we already have seven or eight questions in the Q and A box. The first question I pick comes from Sir Henry Cassick, the Chairman Emeritus of Jardine Matheson. Given your remarks, do you think the British policy of constructive engagement can be successful in China today? Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I suppose um, there's already, you know, you you would all know, um, despite my accent, you would all know what what's going on in the UK much better than I would. But it seems to me that there's kind of already been a shift um, away from the kind of constructive engage or quote unquote constructive engagement that we saw in the kind of Cameron Osborne era, where there was this idea that if you quieten down on criticism of the PRC, you could get all kinds of economic benefits in return. 
Um, I think that that has that has changed quite significantly in the UK. Um, there's now, I think, whereas what when the the context that allowed Cameron and Osborne to pursue that policy was a kind of inter-party apathy on the issue of China. There wasn't very much political interest in uh, how UK foreign policy dealt with the PRC, and there was therefore a lot of space for the government to improvise its own policy. Um, it's clear now that uh, on the Conservative benches, in the Labour Party and, and beyond, there is considerable interest in um, in China, and there is there is quite a lot of pressure for the UK to take a tougher stance, and that's resulted in Boris Johnson, who has on numerous occasions described himself as a natural Sinophile, um, you know, following the US to a large extent on the issue of Huawei, joining the AUKUS deal recently, which of course was a great affront to um, to the PRC, and you know, uh, strengthening Five Eyes cooperation um, when it comes to intelligence on the on the PRC and all, all, all kinds of other measures, and so I guess that that constructive engagement approach has already started to kind of um, be chipped away at a little bit, and uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'd be curious to hear from all of you on, on um, whether that assessment is Peter, accurate. The, the thrust yeah. of the question really isn't about uh, um, whether the UK is still doing it. I think the thrust of the question is, is it a sensible approach? Can it work if the Chinese behave like wolf warriors rather than behaving like normal diplomats? Yeah. Um, so I want to I want to make sure that I don't give kind of um, policy advice because that's not that's not appropriate for me to do. As a, uh, the question doesn't as a come from the government. The, the, the questions uh, come from somebody yeah, yeah. in the community. I, I get it. Um, I think that you know if you talk to people in Washington about who have conducted dialogue with the PRC for decades, there's a feeling that. Um, the formal, the kinds of formal mechanisms that went into constructive engagement, or what you know, however you want to describe the policy, being the era of engagement is the way that Kurt Campbell um, in the White House has has described it. The you know the the strategic and economic dialogue uh, and, and various other mechanisms, they they kind of became like dead ends for to ne for negotiating with the Chinese. The Chinese side would show up with increasingly over the years, a very fixed set of talking points. They wouldn't compromise and they weren't willing to engage in, in very much back and forth at all. And, and there's, you know, that's the reason, uh, or one of the reasons that those dialogues were largely scrapped by the Trump administration and have not been brought back by the Biden administration. And so I, I do think that there's a lot of consensus um, in the US and beyond that those kind of mechanisms uh, didn't have very much success with the PRC, uh, that they shouldn't be brought back in their in their sort of previous form, and also a strong feeling that wolf warrior diplomacy has made that worse. Um, so President Biden said in his recent phone call with Xi Jinping that he was frustrated that, that engagement with China had become um, quite unconstructive and uh, I think he was referencing these displays in places like Anchorage when U.S. diplomats met with um, their Chinese counterparts, where the P you know the PRC interlocutors, the Yang Jiechi in particular, launched this kind of seventeen-minute diatribe um, aimed at his his counterparts. And so, so yeah, I think I think there's a widespread feeling that that uh, that type of engagement had gotten harder, and that wolf warrior diplomacy has made it even more difficult. Okay, uh, we have quite a few questions from very thoughtful people, but I would like to pick the next question from um, Ryota Imamura. Could you please explain the merits and the merits of wolf warrior diplomacy? Do you think the Chinese government is selectively taking the wolf warrior diplomacy after considering and calculating the pros and cons of this policy, of this approach? I thought this follows pretty well to what you were ending with your previous answer. Yeah, um, so I think um, 
the you know the answer in short is that wolf warrior diplomacy is not primarily aimed at foreign audiences i think when chinese diplomats engage in this kind of behavior it's it's primarily aimed at audiences back in beijing um there's xi jinping who has set this kind of assertive tone for chinese foreign policy there's the broader chinese political elite which um has decided post 2008 but but especially in, in more recent years that China needs to take a more assertive stance on, on the global stage. And of course, there's the, the Chinese public, which has very high expectations of um, the, the, the way that, that China can now step up and take a leadership role and no longer needs to kind of kowtow to the West. Um, and I, I think that, that Wolf Warrior Diplomacy is primarily aimed at, at at ticking those boxes and, and pleasing those people. And, and actually you do get quite a strong sense that while there are some people like Zhao Lijin who have, um, who have embraced this kind of new approach with great zeal, there are a lot, a lot of people, perhaps even more people who are quite uncomfortable with it and um, are fully aware of how um, these kind of displays will alienate audiences in the countries where they have after all spent decades studying and living and being posted and you know they, they know full well that a lot of these tactics backfire but um they find themselves in a uh, a political climate that um that is conducive to that 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 type of um behavior so i you know i think i think uh, to to a, to a large extent uh wolf warrior diplomacy has has failed in terms of the metric of, when it comes to the metric of, um, has it improved China's image? Has it helped persuade others? I think it's what, it, what it's done is brought into much sharper focus um, the outside world's kind of um, estimations of, of, of China's intentions. There was for a long time this, this gap between China's assertive military policies and its policy toward territorial disputes and those kind of things. And then the very soft and ameliorative language that the, the foreign ministry and other outward facing institutions would use to describe China's um, intentions. But I think Wolf Warrior Diplomacy has kind of narrowed the gap between those two things, between action and description, and has, um, has kind of, yeah, as I said, has brought that into clearer focus. Can can I actually push you here? Because you said this wolf warrior diplomacy is primarily for the audience of want, and that is Xi Jinping. And the question is about the calculation of uh, cost and benefits. Does Xi Jinping do the cost and benefit calculation? Does he see wolf warrior diplomacy as positive for China or negative to, for China? If he sees this as negative, why would he be pushing for it? Yeah, so I might, so my answer was that on the part of the foreign ministry, which is, of course, the, the institution which has implemented it, um, there is a cost benefit analysis, but that cost, the, the, the benefits are mainly aimed at pleasing Xi. On Xi's part, I think that he has, he, he, he has kind of been steeped in hard power and every, every aspect of his upbringing and his kind of political tutelage and his the, the, has created this worldview where uh, strength is rewarded strength wins deference uh and you know foreign opinion can be um will will, will fall into line in 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 line with 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 national power and i I've, i i remember having a conversation with a chinese diplomat before I left Beijing, who said that, uh, you know, he didn't, he didn't uh, say who that he, he was referencing here, but he said that there's this widespread view in China, which is in the Chinese government, which is becoming increasingly widespread, that China no longer needs soft power, because it can simply buy others um, silence or approval. Um, so I, I think that on the part of Xi Jinping, he wants to see this tough, assertive tone, and he probably thinks it's, you know, we, we're all guessing to a large extent, right? We have to go off publicly available information, but I think he likes the new assertive tone, and he assumes that any downside that there is will be compensated for by the fact that the PRC's national power is on such a dramatic upward trajectory. Okay. 
the next question I pick is kind of picking up on this, and that comes from um, Nicholas Hansen from Harvard. He would like to ask you at which point or at what point will the Communist Party or MOFA move away from wolf warrior approach because it proves ineffective at achieving the party's foreign policy goals and shift back towards a more disciplined approach you outlined as appropriate, for example, uh, dealing with Australia in a better way or uh, employing both strategies simultaneously. Yeah, um, it's, 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 a, it's a question that people here in Washington are asking um, very frequently. And I think it's something that has, is puzzles a lot of long time China watchers. Um, because as you say, in the past, there has been this kind of pattern of overreach and then course correction in Chinese foreign policy. And sometimes it's, it's taken a long time. Uh, and sometimes it's kind of come out of nowhere. I think very, very few people outside of China, outside of China's top leadership really could have predicted the, the opening to the US in the early 1970s. And I'm sure that the, you know, the kind of two decade run after Tiananmen, after 1989, would have been predicted by very many either. Um, but, you know, this, this time the, the assertive turn has gone on for a long time. And, and, and China watchers are kind of wondering, well, how much longer will this be allowed to run before there's some kind of course correction? And I, I think a lot of people thought, perhaps hoped, uh, that, that, that those remarks by Xi Jinping to, the polit to a Politburo study session, which I mentioned earlier, where he talked about the need for China to create a lovable image and a respected image in the world, people hope that that might be the start of a, a course correction. Um, and I know there's, there's work being done um, at University College Dublin at the moment to kind of compare the tweets that were sent out before um, Xi's remarks and then the tweets that were sent out afterwards. Um, so they'll, they'll, they're, they're digging into whether there really has been a difference, but you know, anecdotally and, and based on interviews that I've, I've done, I don't see very much difference in the tone. Actually, in, in the the week after Xi Jinping's um, announcement that he wanted a more lovable image for China, uh, a Chinese diplomat um, posted an image of an extended middle finger um, with a caption that said something like, "This is this is how China will treat its critics," um, which kind of uh, kind of suggested that there wasn't there wasn't too much um, shift that was going on, and I, I don't think we've we've seen much softening of the tone in 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 recent months, with perhaps the the small exception of um, Yang Yichu's recent meeting with Jake Sullivan in in Switzerland, um, and I, I think I think the reason fundamentally that we haven't seen a recalibration um, is that Xi Jinping likes the assertive tone. He thinks that uh, China should be respected and should be afforded uh, a central role in international politics and shouldn't have to uh, make compromises to foreigners who, you know, he said it in a 2008 speech, he dislikes foreigners who have full bellies and have nothing to do but point fingers at the PRC. He disliked it then, he dislikes it now. And China's economy is now tw more than twice as big as it was when he said that. Um, and I, I think there's also another sort of really crucial element here, which is that um, Xi's remarks in that Politburo study session were, were aimed at um, improving the way that China tells its story, but they did not uh, they didn't suggest for a moment that Xi Jinping wants to change the policies which have led in large part to this backlash. You know, wolf warrior diplomacy hasn't taken place in a vacuum. It's taken place uh, as part of a much bigger policy environment, which has seen Western multinational companies alienated by China's industrial policies. It's seen foreign militaries grow alarmed by China's activities in the South China Sea, human rights activists alarmed by crackdowns in Xinjiang and Hong Kong, and you know, the list goes on and on. And uh, President Xi gave no indication that he wants to change the, those policies which have led to the backlash. And, and I think um, 
he's given very little indication that he wants to change the the messaging and communication either. And so I'm not expecting a recalibration in the in the short term for that for that reason. Okay, we have asked like few questions which are generally about wolf warrior diplomacy. Let me now switch track to uh, to ask a couple of questions from the audience which are more specific, and then we can come back to the more general. Um, this question I picked next comes from Jonathan Fenby, who is a research associate at SOAST. And he would like you to focus on China's diplomacy in international organizations. How does the Wolf Warrior style go down at the United Nations and other international organizations? Yeah. Um, or, or, or in this, is China following a wolf warrior approach at the UN? Uh, well, thank you, Jonathan, who is, of course, uh, one of the UK's most eminent um, China watchers. So I'm very grateful that he has um, he's tuned in. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we certainly have seen um, some displays of wolf warrior diplomacy in international organizations. I, I, I would say on the whole, um, China's approach in those, Ch China has this view that international organizations are a, um, you know, a, a, a prime way for it to increase its influence on the international stage. And in many, many forums, the behavior of Chinese envoys remains highly professional and sophisticated in international organizations. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to give a misleading opinion, but there have been cases of I think at the UN in Geneva of, of Chinese uh, diplomats literally banging on the table to drown out the noise of um, speakers who criticize the PRC's human rights record. Uh, and there have also been some extremely barbed remarks um, by Chinese diplomats at the United Nations in, in New York. So there, there have been some displays, I think, that would qualify as wolf warrior diplomacy, but, um, you know, for, for me, kind of stepping stepping back a little bit, the more notable thing is that while the United States was busy leaving the World Health Organization and, you know, trying to cut funding for multilateral organizations, China was busy building influence on the inside. So, so yes, Wolf Warrior Diplomacy, Yes, those tactics have gone badly when they've happened, but actually the, the bigger story is that the PRC has been engaged in building influence while the US has been, um, until very recently at least, has been kind of disengaged and, and pretty hostile to, to those forums. Are you saying that the Chinese are using wolf warrior approach at the UN and being successful, or the Chinese are using a different style of diplomacy at the UN and are being successful? Uh, I would, I mean, it's a, it's a mix of the two. I would say, though, primarily Chinese be behavior at the UN and most multilateral organizations has continued to be pretty professional and constructive with a few high profile examples of Wolf Warrior diplomacy. Um, yeah. And the success is attributed to A or B? The, the six. Chinese diplomats are most effective when they are uh, when when they are when they're fault, they're guided by their expertise and um, conduct themselves in ways that do not reflect wolf warrior diplomacy. Um, I think you know China's China's engagement with multilateral institutions has been a, an incredibly steep learning curve, which ramped up after the eighties and nineties and. The, you know, the foreign ministry had zero expertise on non-proliferation, zero expertise on climate change, found itself really struggling to engage at the G20, for example, on financial issues. And it still does struggle a little bit. And it's it spent a lot, it, you know, with very little influence in international standards making bodies and those kinds of forums and has, has been on this extraordinary learning curve to, to build up its expertise in those forums. And I think... Um, Beneath the surface, be, beneath the kind of some of the kind of theatrics that take place on the surface, its its behavior remains pretty constructive. Okay, the next question, also a more specific one, comes from another very distinguished journalist who is a research associate at SOAS. That's John Gittings. Mm. 
With your knowledge of North Korea, how would you compare the behavior of Beijing's and Pyongyang's diploma diplomats today in the context of the political culture of both regimes? Yeah, it's a great question. I don't, um, and I, I want to make sure that I stay within the bounds of what I know and don't stray into um, into making things up. I think that the 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 big the big um, similarity on the surface is the use of the buddy system. Is move this the fact that that North Korean diplomats uniformly move around in pairs, and Chinese diplomats almost always do. There was a period in the 1990s and the 2000s when Chinese diplomats would sometimes break that rule and would meet with people one-on-one. -on -one. But under Xi, that, that system has been implemented with a, a new zeal. And you know, this, so those, those kind of elements of the system are very, very similar. Um, I, I don't have great expertise on, on North Korea's diplomatic core. And so I wouldn't want to draw um, kind of too many too many comparisons for fear of, of getting things wrong. But I guess just the other the ob other observation that I would offer would be that um, the Soviet Union in many ways provided a model for both um, the, the PRC's diplomacy and North Korea's. And there was, a in, in China's case at least, there was a very, very conscious um, learning process that happened. So some of China's very first diplomats posted overseas, of course, went to um, Moscow, and then they went to other Warsaw Pact um, countries. And they, they were sent out with the explicit mission of gathering information on how do you build a diplomatic service? What does an embassy do? What does the political section versus the cultural section do? And you know all of these kind of, uh, how, how does international law work? How does diplomatic immunity work? All of these very basic things. Um, and the, the, the Chinese embassy in Moscow actually sent back um, notebooks and it sent back telegrams, which were to, to Beijing with the lessons that they had garnered from their Soviet counterparts. And they were used to create a textbook in Beijing, which trained Chinese diplomats. And so I assume that many of the, the similarities which might be there um, would stem from the fact that both were based around this kind of Leninist system. Um, from a very early stage, but you know, it's it's also important to kind of say that uh, for whatever similarities there are, I'm sure that there are also manifold differences. The the fact that that Chinese envoys are well, well you know, their behaviour is is uh, quite tightly controlled when they study overseas. They are able to study overseas. Wang Yi, the foreign minister, studied at Georgetown. Yang Jiechi, the top diplomat, studied at the University of Bath and the London School of Economics. These things are kind of unthinkable in a system, I, I, I believe, unthinkable in a system like North Korea's. And so uh, while, while there are some systemic similarities, there are also just crucial differences based on the fact that China has gone through 40 years of reform and opening and North Korea hasn't. Okay, thank you. The next question I picked partly because it comes from a current student at SOAS, and that is Jess Han. To what extent do you think the new aggressive foreign policy rhetoric is derived from a new sense of confidence and or a sense that China is not being sufficiently respected by the Western countries? Yeah, it's, um, thank you, uh, Jess, I think it was. That's- uh, Jess. It, it, yeah, it's, um, it's 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 an important question. I think I think the answer is both. I think it comes from um, it comes from confidence and it comes from worry and insecurity. Both of those things coexist in the PRC political system and in the the PRC um, foreign ministry. Uh, you know, I, I kind of gave some examples of the the um, response to. Um, the, the global financial crisis, the COVID outbreak, where Chinese leaders felt like their system had been vindicated and that they, they should have, you know, an increased degree of confidence in the world. And uh, these things exist alongside um, insecurities, as I said. And your, your question kind of picked up on this idea of respect. And I think that that's, that's really crucial. 
um, it's actually it's actually something that has has kind of been part this this looking for whether the PRC is being respected and whether its diplomats are being respected is something that has been um, you know part of the foreign ministry's culture really for the seven decades of its um, existence. Um, you know the first generation of Chinese diplomats um, and, and actually the first few generations of Chinese diplomats all had. Um, lived experiences of, of um, you know, national humiliation. Uh, one of China's ambassadors to Paris, Wu Jianmin, uh, found himself, uh, there, he was playing as a kid outside the Chinese embassy in Nanjing and had a, a dog, uh, outside the French embassy in Nanjing and had a dog set on him just for, just for playing there and ended up you know, China's ambassador in Paris and had this, this great sense that he had come from this weak, impoverished place which was now stronger and and deserved respect and and you know from the so from the very outset Chinese diplomats were instructed to look for signs of respect um and that's you know they, they've been they've been sensitive to it ever since um they were you ask U.S. diplomats who dealt with them in the 90s they were extremely prickly about on any occasion when they felt that the the PRC wasn't being treated as an equal um, Xi Jinping's new approach to uh, international diplomacy and great power diplomacy stresses this idea that the two sides must interact as equals, which also I think stems from that that longer tradition. And I, I, I assume that some of what your question is getting at is is whether the kind of wolf warrior tactics have been driven by a perception that China is not getting the respect it deserves, and in, in some important ways um, it, it has. So Mike Pompeo, the former Secretary of US Secretary of State, would repeatedly call into question um, the Communist Party's ruling legitimacy, uh, would hurl insults at China, which kind of went even beyond what, what President Trump was willing to say. And the Chinese Foreign Ministry responded with extraordinary personal attacks and vitriol, which it which I, I've never really seen it level at any other one individual. And I think that those instances of Wolf Warrior diplomacy owed a lot to the idea that China wasn't being sufficiently respected. Um, I think in, in other cases where the, the PRC has, um, you know, uh, there's, the, 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 there's less, the, the PRC is clearly less under attack and less threatened the cases of Wolf Warrior diplomacy in Papua New Guinea and Fiji and Venezuela and other places, it's it's kind of hard to see it coming from that place. It comes, I think, more from a, a feeling that, you know, we're strong and we're going to tell you the way that we should be treated and you will follow because we're strong. So I, I hope that that answers the question. I think that contra is certainly very, very helpful, but kind of a logical follow up is how much more respect can a country ask to receive, apart from being a veto holding member of the permanent member of the UN Security Council with higher representation at UN agencies than any other powers? What will it take? What more? Yeah, um, so I guess, uh, you know, a, a kind of a few things, um, come to mind. First off, I think that there is this um, misperception in Beijing or kind of selective view that, that some people in Beijing have about what it means to be a great power. In my, in my mind, you know, I grew up in Britain in the 90s and 2000s and was a teenager in the when the Iraq invasion was going on. And uh, in my mind, be, being a great power means that you're subjected to constant criticism. You know, um, the U.S. at its zenith, the, the zenith of its international power, was uh, uh, widely disparaged and criticized in Europe. And, and I think, to a large extent, the more powerful you become, the more um, susceptible to criticism you also are. And I, and I, I've often been struck by the fact that the Chinese leaders and Chinese diplomats seem to think that the more powerful they become, the less subject to criticism they should be. Um, whereas in fact, I think it works um, kind of the opposite way. So, so, so some of that comes down to kind of a, a misperception, but when it comes down, you know, when, when you think about specific issues where they believe they're not being respected, here's how 
I think that they would phrase that argument. This is not, this is not my opinion, but this is how I think they would phrase it. Um, they would say, you know, in Li Jiaoxing, former Chinese foreign minister's memoir, he says that China is unlike any other major power because it has never achieved um, national unification and ter its territorial integrity because of, uh, you know, tai Taiwan's continuing separation from mainland rule. So when they see Western countries or, you know, any other country extending diplomatic relations with Taiwan or, um, you know, providing it international space or trade agreements or, or whatever it is, they don't just see that as a challenge to their power, but they see it as a challenge to China's national respect. They see it as a sign that um, the, the other countries think of China as weaker and somehow less deserving of the kind of in territorial integrity that other major powers are entitled to. That's their perspective on it. I think the other, you know, when they, if you talk to Chinese diplomats about Tibet, their perspective is that, um, you know, we don't question whether Alaska is part of the United States. So why are you questioning, you know, and why are you talking to separatists in Tibet about, um, about Tibetan independence? And, and so I, I think that, you know, in, in their minds, a lot of these issues, which for us are just part of the, the day to day of, of bilateral ties with China do come down to whether or not China is respected as an equal member of the international system. Um, and, and, and have, of course, have their roots in some of these very, very deep set historical um, issues. Um, the next question I pick, kind of pick it because it follows partly on, 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 on your earlier answer. And this comes from a student based in London who prefers to be anonymous. And the question is, does wolf warrior diplomacy play out differently in different regions compared to say between Europe and the United States. Um, I think underlying it is perhaps your earlier answer in terms of um, the Chinese perhaps have a reasons to feel that Pompeo and the US government, some US government officials were being rather disrespectful, mm -hmm. but you actually saw more wolf warrior style of diplomacy in European countries and in South America and in, in fact, just north of the border from you in Canada, where they were much more respectful of China than the United States under the Trump administration was. Yeah, um, so, so this gets a, some really important um, nuance around the question of, of Wolf Warrior diplomacy. I, I think there are a couple of different ways you can kind of uh, split the, the, the different approaches that China takes. Um, one is kind of weak countries versus strong countries. I think on the whole, uh, China tends to be more, the, 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 the greater China perceives a country's power to be, um, the, the greater China's restraint is. You know, it's this weird, it, it, if you talk to people in Washington, you would think that the United States had been the primary target of wolf warrior diplomacy. And that's, that's not true. If you look at um, the behavior of Chinese envoys based in Washington, um, the former ambassador Tui Ting Kai, the new ambassador Qing Gang, they're, they're pretty restrained in the way that they express themselves. And I think that stems from the fact that despite all of the differences between China and Washington, between Beijing and Washington, uh, you have to work with the United States. No matter who you are, it's still the biggest economy in the world and has the most powerful military in the world. Um, and so Chinese diplomats conduct themselves with a, a kind of sense of restraint that, that just doesn't exist when Chinese envoys are working in, um, you know, in, in, in Canada or France or Britain, Australia. Uh, Chinese diplomats have been far, far less restrained and, and, and more combative in those places. And I, I think the, the primary reason for that is the difference in strength between those, um, those countries. So that's, that's kind of one way to split it. I think another way to split it is, is, is uh, developed world versus developing. Um, and wolf warrior diplomacy has been... Um, 
a feature to a greater or lesser extent of China's diplomacy with most Western countries. But I think we've seen very few examples of it, to, to my knowledge, in Africa, for example, um, where China seems to have continued with this kind of like other tradition that I talked about of, of charm offensive diplomacy. And, you know, over time, those those two approaches have always coexisted and been in different balances in different places and different times. And as far as I know, in Africa, it's continued. In other parts of the developing world, in India, uh, you know, China has certainly engaged in war warfare diplomacy. Its, it's um, consulate in Kolkata has been particularly vocal on, on Twitter. Um, and we've seen just last week uh, a whole series of statements about Taiwan from the, the Chinese embassy in New Delhi, um, which which kind of suggests that harder approach. And, you know, I, I, I guess that, you know, probably one of the reasons for that is that China feels like India is ganging up on it with um, countries like Australia and Japan and the United States and, and wants to try to discourage that. But I, I think, in fact, uh, the PRC's behavior in that case has had exactly the opposite effect and is encouraging India to further cooperate with those countries. So th th those are kind of two of the ways I divide it up. Okay, since you mentioned Tibet earlier, let me bring in a question from a Tibetan who is living in uh, India, uh, Tenzin't Kuga. He, Tenzin's got two questions. One is, how do those people who are living within China view China's wolf warrior diplomacy? So I think it focuses on the people. The second question is, given your research into this subject, do you think China's wolf warrior diplomacy is serving the PRC well? Or is it um, delivering some kind of self of own goals? Yeah, so um, the, the question of, of whether it's popular is, uh, as, as you all know, very, very hard to answer. And, um, you know, opinion polling is scarce in China. It's often not reliable when it does exist. And it's a nation of 1.4 billion people. And so all of those provisos um, kind of at the outset, I think my impression is that, that it is largely popular. Um, I think most of the Chinese public don't pay, just, just like in America, most of the Chinese public don't pay attention to foreign policy most of the time. So it would be, it would be wrong to think that people, that the, the whole of the public was kind of looking out for, for how its envoys were behaving. But there is a very active part of the Chinese public, which is very vocal online, um, which, which does watch very closely the tone that the foreign ministry takes. And in the 90s and 2000s, was extremely critical of the way that the foreign ministry behaved and mm. believed that it was, uh, it was being far too soft. There were members of the Chinese public who sent calcium tablets to the foreign ministry in Beijing with the implication that uh, the backbones of Chinese diplomats were too weak and needed to be strengthened. Um, those people... Have, uh, have frequently celebrated um, some of the outbursts which have become known as wolf warrior diplomacy. And in fact, uh, after Yang Jiechi's um, kind of dressing down of his US counterparts in, in Alaska in March, uh, there were even t-shirts made and merchandise sold um, kind of celebrating um, some of the language that he used. Um, that those people in those instances don't represent the whole of the Chinese public, but um, as far as I can tell, yeah, it's um, it's 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 broadly popular with with some major detractions from foreign policy elites who would like more focus on winning over global opinion, um, and I think kind of you know related to that, the second question on whether this is an own goal, uh, I I think broadly yes. I think I think the way that that it's it the, the 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 one sort of success I can think of for wolf warrior diplomacy is making it, it it kind of amplifies existing strengths in the PRC's approach to diplomacy, which is that PRC is very very good at communicating its bottom line to other countries. It has a clear red line on uh, Taiwan. There's a clear red line on criticizing China about Tibet. 
um, and, you know, and so on and so forth. PRC has always been good at communicating those and the wolf warriors have, if there was anyone in any doubt of China's stance on those issues, the wolf warriors have certainly helped to, um, to clarify things. Um, but but on on the whole, I don't I don't really see any evidence of it of it being effective. Um, as I said, it seems to have convinced many people who who might have have uh, not made up their minds about China's intentions that there's something to worry about with China's rise. It's alienated uh, you know elites across the West and as I said, in many developing countries. Uh, and I think it's it's probably increased the costs of China's rise, um, and uh, it's it's hard for me to see it as anything but a but an own goal. Next questions come from the Polish Academy of Sciences, um, Marta Tomsak. He is a fan of, of of you, and he's going to get get a copy of your book. Has your research covers the program of the training of diplomats, whether it's in the diplomatic training school or in the ministry. He's wondering if this has changed in recent years because what the Wolf Warrior diplomats are behaving simply are not in line with what Chinese diplomats used to do. Are they being trained? Yeah, um, so it's 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 a subject that really fascinated me as I was researching the book, and you'll see references to the way that Chinese diplomats are, are trained kind of throughout the book. And as, as I mentioned uh, early on, there was a stress on, um, you know, methodologies that had been garnered from the, the Soviet Union and from the communist world um, and, there was also, because the learning curve was so steep, you know, China's first generation of diplomats, many didn't speak foreign languages, some had never been overseas or even met a foreigner in some cases. Um, and, and lots of the first ambassadors had been previously generals in the People's Liberation Army. Um, so the learning curve for them was extremely steep, not just in kind of the, the how-tos of diplomacy, but the, the foreign ministry undertook training sessions on things like how do you attend a diplomatic reception? How do you eat with a knife and fork? How do you make small talk at a, at a drinks party? And, and those kinds of things, and down to the level of like very detailed guidance on like how not to make too much noise as you ate food and those kinds of things. And, and of course, lots of that stuff has, as, as China has modernized and opened up to the world, lots of that content has been reduced or even completely eliminated. So now the, uh, the kind of etiquette training um, that goes on in the foreign ministry is, is very, very minimal um, and is, has been reduced largely just to a set of guidance rather than to any kind of formal training. At the same time, China's ability to, um, it, you know, has, to, to provide lang linguistic training or, uh, or, or subject Kind of specialized training has increased dramatically. There was an effort in the late 1950s after the Bandong Conference as China um, established relationships with the developing world, Zhou Enlai put out a, an instruction saying that um, capacity for language training should be, should be greatly expanded. And, and there was this kind of uh, slow and steady move toward professionalism away from that, those kind of original rough and ready diplomats to a, to a cadre of very um, sophisticated and, and well-trained diplomats over the decades. There, there were big setbacks, um, the, the cultural revolution being the very greatest one, but, a, but throughout the decades and especially since the 1980s, that kind of specialism that's been promoted in the training has just gotten stronger and, and stronger. Um, I think, you know, one of the, the question marks now is whether the politicization of education in the PRC will, will impact diplomats training. It's too, I think it's too early to, to tell what impact it will have, but you know, there have been some high profile cases of professors at um, some of the foreign ministries feeder schools getting in trouble for making comments, which were seen as too liberal or too pro-Western. And so we'll see if there is kind of a, 
a, a shift in, in, in Chinese diplomats training that happens on the basis of that, but it's early days. Next question comes from Grace Gao. Besides successfully holding the 2008 Summer Olympics, China's newfound confidence come mainly from its tremendous economic successes in recent decades. International companies and or businesses have helped to contribute to this rise of China's power and assertiveness. What can the West or the international society do to counter China's aggression? In so let me make sure I understand the question correctly. So a lot of the new confidence comes from economics. It, from economics to which we in the West have contributed and helped to build up. Right. Now the question is, what can the West or the international society do to deal with it? I think uh, that the increasing answer is that <laughs> that the people here in Washington give anyway is is that the the ability of the outside world to influence China's economic trajectory is quite limited outside of a small number of very strategic sectors where China um, currently lacks technology. So there are there are areas, for example, semiconductor production. Uh, engines for aircraft and you know a few other sectors where where china really does need outside technology and there are, there is quite serious thinking going on here and in many other foreign capitals um to try and figure out um what measures can be taken to limit china's access to those technologies but i think um a, a lot of people feel like you know, you know president trump articulated this desire to um prevent China from taking any other, making any kind of economic progress which would see it further catch up with the West and I think um, you know it's pretty clear that the Trump administration was not successful in that um, in that endeavor and I don't think there are very many people in Washington who who, who believe that it can be successful on that front simply because um, the Chinese government's uh, far more in control of its destiny than than outsiders are. Okay, we've got five minutes left, and there are three questions that I would quite like to fit that, fit them in for you, um, Peter. The first question is a theoretical one from Philip Lim. Have the theoretical underpinnings of China's wolf warrior diplomacies been influenced in any way by Carl Schmitt's friend-enemy distinction? Uh, I don't know how the, you know, Carl Schmitt's thought is undergoing something of a renaissance in the PRC, and there's been considerable um, interest in that topic. Um, I don't know how that feeds into the, the thinking about wolf warrior diplomacy. Uh, I do know that on the theme of friends and enemies, that Mao Zedong's thoughts on the difference between friends and enemies and the vital task of distinguishing between the two um, has, has been important from the outset and that the, um, the foreign ministry and the, the rest of the Chinese government continues to make distinctions between individuals who are seen as, as, as friendly to the PRC and those who are seen as hostile to the PRC. And I think that certainly that follows in the tradition of Mao's thinking on friends and enemies. I don't know how Schmidt fits into the picture though. Okay, thank you. Uh, second last question from Norman Stockman in Aberdeen in Scotland. Would it help to bring the reporting of Chinese diplomacy by Western media into the analysis? Quiet, professional, constructive diplomacy is not news, whereas a wolf warrior outburst is news. So the question is, is it real or is this just Western reporting? Yeah, it's a, you know, it's an important question. And of course, like no one wants to write the um, dog bites man story, right? Um, 
you want to write the man bites dog story but this is this is not just a matter of um media reporting it's a matter of talking to um interlocutor you know western diplomats uh foreign diplomats who have spent decades engaging with the prc and have witnessed a dramatic change in the behavior of chinese diplomats not just in public but also in private meetings um and you know so so and, and of course also to looking at the the warnings of many chinese foreign policy scholars and former chinese diplomats who are alarmed at the direction that chinese diplomacy has taken so it's always a good idea to to keep a check on media reporting and media priorities but i think the evidence for it uh, it just extends so much further beyond that 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 we can be pretty assured that it's a real phenomenon very last question, not specifically about wolf warriors, but about Chinese diplomacy nonetheless, um, is from Shantanud Noida. What is your views about the BRI? Is it going to be successful in African countries because of the frequency of coups in Africa? The, the, the frequency of what in Africa? Could they tell Oh, um, so I think <laughs> I think I think that the BRI in many ways represents the the strength that some some of the PRC's greatest strengths when it comes to diplomacy, which is not not the ability to persuade people through words, but the ability to persuade people through incentives and inducements. Um, and on, on, on that front. Um, you know, China, I think, has been has been much more successful than um, the U.S. has. Many, many, much of the U.S.'s appeal comes from its values and comes from the security blanket that it, it extends to other countries. And much of China's appeal comes from uh, from its economic um, mm -hmm. uh, its ability to provide economic goods. And you see that with the BRI. And there have been um, stumbles um, in recent years. You know, uh, mm -hmm. coups. Being among them, this 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 problem of providing continuity between uh, in recipient countries, um, but I think by and large the appeal is is pretty strong, and it, it's kind of the it's kind of the flip side of of wolf warrior diplomacy. Well, with that, I will have to draw these webinars to a close. We are bang on at six thirty London time. Thank you very much. Peter Martin for a very thought-provoking webinar. I think the, kind, the, the range and the depth of the questions shows how much interest you have generated. Thank you to you and thank you to all of you who have taken part in this webinar, whether you ask a question or stay silently. I look forward to seeing some more of you at the webinar next week. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you and goodbye.